Okay, similar to lab one, what we're going to have to do each time is launch Microsoft Visual C++ 2008 Express and Internet Explorer. And let's start that. So we've got this coming up and we've got our, if you look here, we've got lab one from last time still sitting in our recent projects. And if you've got a U drive and that's connected, you should see that happening. Let's just put this in the background and let's launch Internet Explorer. And again, this is going to take us into Blackboard. And if you remember from last time, if you don't remember, you're going to have to type in my.senecacollege.ca and it will do all the rest to bring up this login screen. And then you're going to have to, hopefully you've got your login figured out by now, and be able to type in your username and password. And that gives you access to all the content that instructors have posted for you online. And the stuff that I happen to have here is a number of PRG lab and theory classes. And as I said last time, PRG 155A, PRG 155B, PRG 155C are the lab sections. PRG 155AC is a theory section. So we want to deal with just a lab. Now you're only going to have one theory section, one lab section showing up. So make sure you click on the actual lab section. I'm just going to use A. Now when we go in here, again, it depends on how you're instructor set things up and I may choose if it's even me to change things around right now I've got all my lab modules under assignments but I might have next time a section that says lab modules and a different one that says assignments you're gonna have to check with your instructor to see where things are now right now as I said it's under assignments and when I click on that it's gonna bring up these links and these link this particular link here to lab 2 brings up this Adobe Acrobat file Regardless of where the files are, you should actually print these out and have them ready to bring in before the lab starts and have lab 1 through lab 10. And if you have your five assignments, if you have it all printed out and get yourself organized at the start, you'll have no problems later in the course. Now one of the other things that you should make sure you do every time you come in the lab is to neatly print your last name, your first name, write in your student ID legibly here, and circle just one of these, whichever one is your lab section. If you're in PRG 155B, circle this. If you're in PRG 155E, circle this. But just circle one of these. Now, what we want to do is, if you take a look down here, we have a program that has to be put into Visual Studio. And it talks about select new project, console application, add new item. We'll show you how to do that today. We're actually going to create a project, and under that project name of Lab 2, we're going to have three labs, Lab 2A, Lab 2B, Lab 2C. So we'll get at that shortly. Notice that the code that is here starts here at this start of comma and goes down. Currently, what you're going to find is up here, we have to have the text selection tool, the I, capital I, with the arrow selected. And over here, the current... Uh, you know, screen resolution is a little bit too high at 100%. We're going to drop that down. I think 75% is about right. So if we scroll down here with the text selection tool highlighted, we should be able to left mouse click, hold it down, and select all of this, and that becomes our whole program. And to copy that, we just hold down the control, press C, and it's put it into our paste buffer. The next step is to switch over, Alt, and we're holding the Alt key down tab until we get to uh, 2008 Express Edition. And what we're going to have to do, as we did last time, is File, New, Project. And you can do this by actually Control, Shift, N, as you may have filled in in your sheet last week. And when we do that, again, what we're going to have up here is Project Types, CLR, Win32 in general. We're going to choose Win32, Console Application, or Keyboard and Screen. Uh, lab 1 was all just screen output. This week, or this lab, we're going to be using keyboard input and screen output both. So what we have to do is go down here and type in a name. And I'm going to type in lab 2. And if we take a look what that means, that's the name. And I've selected again the F drive because that's where my U drive is. And if I slide over here, we're going to create a directory for this solution. That means there's going to be a lab2 directory, and under that lab2 directory, we're going to put in lab2a, 2b, 2c. So let's see how to do that. So let's just say OK. And one of the other things that comes up is this wizard, the Win32 application wizard. And we've got two options here that you can either go over here and use next or previous to go between these two. 
but we're just going to go up here this time and just click application settings and the current settings the default is console application which is what we need for the application type but we this time are going to use instead of what we did last time we're going to use empty project so the two things that we're going to do from now on for the rest of the semester is console application and down here empty project so I'm just going to select empty project and save finish now one of the things that you're going to notice if we take a look here we've got our lab 2 folder which is our project folder but this time we have no header files no resource files no source files we have nothing because we're going to have to create that starting from scratch now what we're going to do is we're going to right mouse click on source file we're going to hit add and then new item so right mouse click source file add new item and when you do that it's going to come up with a little thing here that says what kind of categories well we've got three UI for user interface code and property sheets we're going to select code and we're going to also make sure it will by default select C++ um, code sheet that, or code that we need and what we have to do now is go down here for name and this is where we're going to put in lab 2a so lab 2a is going to be if we take a look here lab 2a is going to be our first CPP or C++ program and it's going to be under the lab 2 folder and all we have to do next is just hit add so if we hit add what it's going to do is generate this so now what we have over here is we do have under source files lab 2a dot cpp under the lab 2 project folder now you're saying to yourself well what do we do now well the next thing to do is all we have to do is control v if you remember previously we did a control c to copy all that program code so i'm just going to do a control v and paste all that stuff in and once it's pasted in what i'm going to do is go full screen i'm going to go view and go full screen or shift enter uh, shift alt enter and when we do that there's a couple things that sometimes get screwed up one of the things you'll notice here if we take a look these two forward um, slashes that we've got here are single line comments and the single line comment meant to actually be variable declaration as a comment and sometimes it screws that up so what we're going to do is we're just going to go over here and put the cursor right here on where it says variable declaration we're just going to hit the delete key or the backspace key and when we do that it's going to put it up where it should be and we should do that for where it also says get number from user we'll just back that up as well we'll click on print the number to two decimal places these are just straight comments so I don't know why it does this but sometimes it does this so what we should see is uh, when we're finished we should have a comment that's very let's drop this down a little bit we should have variable declaration get input number we should have print the number wait for the user to hit those are the things that should be and that should pretty much clean up and deal with that problem now one of the things that we saw before is up here full screen and sometimes full screen is a good thing sometimes it's not so if you click on that it actually takes you back to this other view of things and sometimes this is helpful to see what's going on over here or over here it gives you all these windows to deal with and if you remember last time between this bracket here and the one at the bottom what we want to do is indent so we're just going to highlight all of this stuff down to here and if you remember if we go up here and we take a look we want to increase indent so sometimes you can't see this menu easily in full screen mode but you can when you go back out of full screen mode so I'm just going to click on that to put it back and then I'm going to say view and go down here to full screen or shift alt enter so we've got everything indented everything seems to be okay uh, we have a multi-line comment here and uh, we've got everything working the only thing now that left to do as you remember from before is to actually change the quotes so that they're proper quotes now sometimes what happens is uh, you have stuff that seems to go off the screen sometimes you pick font sizes that are too big so what we're going to do is we're going to go under tools and under tools right at the bottom we're going to select options and when you go to tools and options you're going to see this screen coming up and under that you're going to find fonts and colors and that's what we're going to select so let's do that fonts and colors and when we do that it's going to allow us to change the font size 
something that's going to be easier to work with, that's going to work within the framework that we've got. And if we take a look over here to the right, currently our size is 19. And a size of 19 right now seems just a little bit big in full screen mode to make everything work within our existing screen. So we're going to just drop that down a little bit. So I'm going to drop this down to, I don't know, uh, let's try about 15. And hopefully you can still see this on the video. Whoops, 15 is probably a little too small. So let's go back to options again very quickly. I'll boost this up to about, I think 17 should be just about right. And it just seems to fit everything on the screen. So as before, what we have to do is change all our quotes. Now, I'm going to change the printf ones. Those, those ones are fairly simple. And as you see, things are changing back to red as they should. But let's take a look at this command here. Let's take a look at the scanf. Now, no scanf starts. Printf, as we saw before, is a way of printing stuff on the screen, on the console screen. Scanf is a way of getting things from the keyboard and making them available. Now, one of the things you're going to find is that there's two quotes here, but there's no quotes there, so it's a little different. And even some of the printf statements will have quotes in strange looking locations, not always at the start and at the end. So what I need you to do is go through, even this printf doesn't have one at the beginning and end, but just change the existing double quotes. Don't put in any extra quotes. Don't move them around. Just change them right where they are, and you'll have everything ready to go for the next section of your code. So once you've got that done, we'll continue on with the video. Okay, now that we have our program completely ready to go, let's see what it is we're supposed to do with this thing. So let's all tab back to Internet Explorer and uh, see what's going on. And if you look back here, it says, strangely enough, that what we want to do is use F5 to compile and run your program. And we're going to enter a number uh, 44.4455 as a number, what number is output. And so we'll get an idea of roughly what the program does. So we're always going to use this F5. And we're going to be using a little trick. And one of the things that you're going to find, and this is kind of strange, is we have a number of values here that we want to put in. 9.99, 9.995, 9.99, 9.995, and so on. And we can see over here the classical expected values if we're rounding numbers to two decimal places. And the round rule says that if it's the third digit after the decimal place is five or bigger, you make the digit to the left go one higher. So that's the rounding rules. And based on basic rounding rules with these numbers, these are the expected values. However, you're not going to get the expected values in all cases. And this is something that we're going to have to live with and find out about. So let's see how we go about making this happen. So let's go back to our program. And before we do, let, let's do one little thing here. Uh, the number, and this is really cool, I like this. If you can select the number here and control C it for those people that are very lazy like me, control C, let's alt tab back. And now let's run our program by hitting F5. And it's going to do our com compiling and so forth and so on like this and linking. And it's going to generate a program that's going to ask us for keyboard input from our console. So it's just about ready to go here. So let's see. Wait for it. There we go. So it says input a floating point number here. Now, as we saw before, if we right mouse click on the blue bar and go down to edit, this time we're going to say paste. And notice what it did. It actually pasted up here the number that we copied in. So edit, paste. Isn't this so this is going to make it a lot easier for us to actually type in the numbers without typing in the numbers. Now if we hit enter, let's take a look up on the screen. So we started off with 44.4455. This program is supposed to round to two decimal places, so logically it should be 44.45 because five, the third digit is bigger than is five or bigger, so that should make the 44.44 become 44.45, and indeed it does. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to fill in this chart over here on this. What is the number output? We're just going to write 44.45 here. That's a number. But then we're going to do the same with all these numbers. So we're going to run the program, grab this number. And I think you're going to appreciate when you get to this point, you want to grab this number. It's a lot easier to get it right by Control-C. Go back over here, and we'll rerun that. 
uh, just F5, run it up again, there it is, and right mouse click, if you didn't see it before, edit and paste. And this time when we hit it, you can see that that's the number, and notice this time, which is really strange, it should be 10.0. There's no question about it. But notice here that it's not giving us 10.0, isn't it? So one of the problems that we run into is something called round off error. Computers unfortunately have that. There's ways around this, as we'll see later, to improve accuracy. But for now, let's just write down these results. Now once you've got the chart filled in, and you'll notice that most, some of them are OK, some of them are not the expected values, that's fine. Just realize that there, it should be the expected values, and sometimes it's not. Now what it's saying down here is comment out the line by using two forward slashes, which is a single line comment, get ch. So what it's trying to say is, what is the difference, basically, between using get ch and what, the one that we used last week, which was get char. So these are two functions. Both of them seem to hold the screen open, as we'll see, because they've, they've done that. You've used get ch, and you probably didn't even realize you're using get ch. So let's take a look at your program code. Let's go back over here. And notice, in this case, let's go up just a little bit. Uh, one of the things that you're going to find, and you're learning a little bit about this at a time, when we use these include statements, and if we use standard io.h, that has definitions for printf and scanf and get char. So if we're using a function printf, scanf, or get char, we have to include the definitions for these functions, and those are found in standard io.h. Notice here we've got include con io.h, and over here it says definitions for just get ch. Now there's other functions, but those are the only ones that we're using in here. If we slide down to the bottom of our code, and let's just get rid of the output put the debug window here. If we slide down here, you can see that in this case, we're using get ch. And we used last time, when we were doing print tests, we used always get char. So there seems to be a difference between them. And let's try and discover what those differences are, because that's what it's asking. If we look back over here, it's asking, what is the difference between get ch and get char? Now, let's flip over here, and let's do what it says. What we're going to do is I'm just going to put two forward slashes in front of this and put in get char because we used get char last time and you'd think it should work and let's see so when you're finished you should have commented out the get ch and put in get char now we have definitions for both printf scanf get char as well as get ch so we can use whichever one is the best for us to use but now let's hit f5 and build this program up and see if it's going to work properly so and find out if there is a difference between these two functions. So watch what happens this time. Yeah, I'm just going to, I wonder if I can just paste the last value. Let's see, edit, paste. Yep, there's the number. Now watch when I hit enter. I'm just going to hit it once, and it closed the screen. And it didn't do that with get ch. With get ch, it held the screen open. Well, one of the things that you're going to find, and let's just take a look at the code here and get an idea of what this get char does, and let's go back here and take a look. What get char does is it waits for an enter key. That's what it waits for. But everything you type goes into something called a keyboard buffer. Now, one of the things you're going to find is, as long as you're just using print apps, that's fine. You never hit an enter key, do you? You only hit an enter key when you get to the get char. Well, what happens when you put something in with a scanf? You have to type a number, and to terminate that number, you have to hit the enter key. Well, strangely enough, one of the things that you're going to find is that the percent %f, when you scan percent %f, it grabs the floating point number out of this thing called the keyboard buffer, but it leaves the enter key sitting there. And one of the things you're going to find is when it gets down to here, one of the big differences between get ch and get char is get ch will actually flush everything out of the buffer and wait for a new character. That's what it does, and that means that it's able to hold the screen open. But what get char does is says, oh, I just need an enter key. You got one? There, Miller time. I'm out of here. So let me try one other thing to show you that this is indeed the case, and we'll write this up, the, the actual conclusion that we need. What would happen if I put another get char? So instead of just having the one get char, if I go down here and put two get chars, if my theory is correct, the get char grabs the enter key that we typed in after the number, 
the next get char should wait for another enter key and hold the screen open. So let's build the thing by hitting F5 and see what happens. So in this case, it should behave properly. I'm just going to right mouse click. Oh, I can't because did I copy that? Let's see. Right mouse click, edit and paste. There's your number. When I hit enter key this time, notice that it holds the screen open because the enter key that I typed in up here after this number was captured by the first get char down here and it took it right out of the buffer because there was nothing grabbing it out of the buffer. But the second get char waited down here after hit any key to continue. The second get char waits for another enter key before it terminates. Now here's something else that's kind of weird. Get char, if I, I can type any character I like and it's not going to close the screen until I hit the enter key. Isn't that bizarre? So there are differences. Let's take a look and see how we're going to write this up. Compile and run the program a couple of times and describe the difference between get ch. Well, what you write down is the following. Get ch flushes the keyboard buffer and waits for a new character. Get ch flushes the keyboard buffer and waits for a new character. Get char takes the enter key from the scanf and closes the screen. Get char takes the enter key from the keyboard buffer and closes the screen. And that's basically the difference between them. Get ch will flush the buffer and wait for a new character. Get char will will actually um, grab whatever happens to be sitting in the keyboard buffer. Now I hesitate to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So you're talking about keyboard buffer. Well, is there some way of preparing the keyboard buffer so you can use getchar? And the answer is yes. There is an f flush standard in command, and I'll just put a comment: flush keyboard buffer. So let's take a look at that. Let's bring up our magnifying glass here and take a look. So one of the things that you'll find is if you want to use getchar, and we're going to find this when we're dealing with character input. You should always f flush is a function, and it's also in uh, standardio.h. The definitions for f flush are in standardio.h. But if you flush standard in, standard in, your standard in is the keyboard, which is part of your console. Standard out, S T D O U T, is the screen. So standard in is our keyboard. So flushing standard in flushes out the enter key and any other stuff that happens to be in the keyboard buffer you may have typed that wasn't grabbed by the scanf and then get char. Now let's see how that works. I'm just going to so we only have one get char. Let's run that up and I just hit F5 and so if we flush the enter key out or anything else that's in the keyboard buffer and let's see if I can do that again. Right mouse click, edit, paste and if I hit enter it works perfectly fine. So the, the whole concept of keyboard buffer is when we use scanf, there's a keyboard buffer there. Anything we type in goes into the keyboard buffer and is going to be a problem if we don't use either F flush standard in with get char, or if we want, we can get around that problem by using get ch. Let's try running that one more time. Let me just show you one other thing, which I'm talking about. If I say edit, paste, let's put a space in. Let's say edit and paste again. So if I have two numbers in and the scanf is only waiting for one number, so if we have two numbers in our buffer and scanf is only really going to grab one because there's only 1% f, what does it do with the other? Well, it's going to have a space and a number and when we hit the enter key, an enter key sitting in the buffer. And this is not a problem because when I hit the enter key on this, it's only going to work with the first number and flush f flush will flush all of this other crap out of here so it's only ever going to deal with this number the enter key is flushed and any other numbers that you might type in are gone if you use f flush and that's one of the reasons for going through the f flush with you now i do apologize it's something that you probably won't get to until a little bit later but it's important that you understand these concepts now let's see what we have to do with the next part of the lab so let's switch over and if we slide down here, it says remove the code for lab2.cpp, but don't delete it, and select add new item and enter the code below as lab2b. As we said earlier, we're going to have lab2 as the project folder. 
but we can only have one active C++ source file at a time. That means we're going to have to remove to bring in another one, and so if we have three different files, we can only have one of them that's there at a time, and we have to remove the other ones, and then we can re-bring them back, and there's some other things that are involved in this. So let's go and see how we go about doing that. Let's go back to uh, here and go back from full screen so we can see what's going on. Now what we're going to have to do, and I'll just bring this up here, is we're going to have to right mouse click where it says lab2a.cpp and we're going to select remove from project. So let's take a look and see how that works. Right mouse click and uh, we're going to go down here where there's an X and hit the remove and after that we have a number of options. We have remove, delete, and cancel and it says remove it from that, choose delete to permanent delete. We don't want it permanently deleted. We want to just remove it. So let's hit remove and you'll notice as soon as we do that up here in our source files we no longer have it listed. So what we want to do at this point is we want to create a new one. So let's go up here and do what we did at the start. So we're going to use this. Right mouse click, add under source file, new item. Right mouse click, source file, add new item. And again, we're going to set up the same stuff as we had before. It's going to be code. It's going to be a C++ file. And what we have to do is go down here and enter a new name. And that new name is going to be lab2b. So we'll say lab2b. And again, what we're going to find is that lab2b is going to be under the lab2 folder. So if we go up here once we've done that, we're going to find lab2. There's a lab2 folder. Right now we have lab2b. Lab2a hasn't gone anywhere other than just being taken out of the lab2 project. And we can bring it back as you'll see later. But right now we want to start with this new lab2.c++ file. So let's get doing that. And what we're going to have to do is, like we did before, we're going to go back here and this program that we've got, we can just use, since we've got this all set up, we can right mouse, or left mouse click rather, all of our program, can do control C, alt tab back over here, and just paste this in. And again, let's see, is there anything that screwed up? No, everything looks good. Let's go and take a look at view. Let's look at full screen. And so we got a little bit more real estate to work with here. And some of the things, everything seems fine, but what we want to do is indent this stuff. So we're just going to select this. Notice we're using a get char this time. And again, we're going to drop down from full screen mode here uh, so we can get access to the uh, increase indent button here. So let's do that and click on that. Everything, and then we'll go back to full screen mode again and take a look at that. And once we've done that, everything's ready to go. All that remains to be done is to just basically take all the quotes as we did before and put them into proper quotes. And one of the things you'll notice as you go through this is that uh, there's quotes around stuff. Let's just take a look at one example up here. For instance, here, printf, send something to screen, backslash n we've seen before inside the quotes, and then percent 5.2f. Percent 5.2f is what's called the print format specifier, and it's going to print this number, 34.566, in this format. So what it does, it takes this number and substitutes it into uh, the stuff inside the quotes. So what it says is a field of 5 with two decimal places, so it should be 34.57. It should be printed on a new line in a field of five and so on. So these are some of the things that you should read over in the textbook to understand. But for now, let's just make sure that when we do this, we just change just the quotes that are here. Don't put any new ones in. Don't move the quotes around. Just fix them up. And start up the video as soon as you've done all that. You can pause the video at this point. And when you start it up again, I'll have everything ready to go. OK, when you're finished and have everything done, you should see it roughly looking like this. As I said, the stuff that's in the quotes is stuff that's going to be printed out, or it's a format in which information after the quotes is going to be printed out. And one of the things we should do each time now, we, let's go back from full screen mode, back here again to this. And one of the things that you're going to find is when we take out, say, a lab2a and replace it with lab2b or something like this and change the source files by removing one and putting a new one in, one of the things you should always do is go to build and say clean. And we'll just clean lab2. So that's what we've got up here is clean lab2. When we do that, it's going to do some stuff. And down at the bottom here, it should say 
uh, clean here, one succeeded, zero failed, zero skipped. And what clean does is sometimes if you don't, what happens when you hit F5 the next time, it may run the previous lab to A or whatever. So every time when you remove one and put one in, please do a clean. After that, if you do F5, it should come up exactly with what the output should be for this. So every time you switch CPP files around, always do a clean first. And then when it comes up with this, you'll find the output screen is going to have exactly this output. Now, one of the things that you should be able to do, and let's slide this over here again. Let's bring this up. Because one of the things it says, it says use a pencil, a pencil, to show the exact output of this program. Because as I said on an upcoming quiz or midterm or even maybe the final exam, there's always a question that says show the exact output. Do you understand format specifications in terms of how output comes? So let's bring the output window up with this and let's see what it should roughly look like. And again, there's a backslash in at the top, so that's why there should not be anything on this top line. Let's count them again. One, including the top line, one blank line. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You find that when you count these, there's exactly eleven. Make sure that everything lines up. One of the things you're going to find is what I've done to make things a little easier for you is I've set up a grid here. So this goes on the top or the second top line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The zero represents ten. The one the next one represents eleven. So this is one through nine, ten through nineteen, twenty through twenty. So this is basically a grid here and here to help you figure out when you have to do this yourself, why the output is this way. For now, all you have to really do is just write down exactly, leaving this top line blank, write down exactly what you've got here. But the next thing that you should be doing and thinking about once you finish this exercise is take a look at my pro or your program code. Let's take a look at this again in uh, full screen mode. And let's slide this down a bit so we can take a look. And let's bring our output window up into here. And when we take a look here, you should be able to figure out why there's nothing on the top line. And if we do that, let's take a look. There shouldn't be anything on the top line because of the backslash n. Then it's printing this grid and then and so forth. So as you go through this, read through the notes on print format specifications and, and see if you can figure out why it's giving exactly this output. So not only should you copy it down, but figure out why it's doing that. Okay, and we'll be continuing on with the next once you've got that chart filled in. And one of the techniques that we looked at before when we run up our program that's going to be very useful to keep a permanent record and print as you print your programs out is right mouse click on the blue bar, go down to edit, go to mark, wait until it flashes, left mouse click on the flashing part, highlight this entire section, then somewhere over in the black section, right mouse click, hit enter, and that's put it into the paste buffer. And let's get rid of this uh, window here. And remember our program goes from here down to here. So anywhere after here, what we're gonna do is put a forward slash star to make a comment and we're going to control V, put our output in, and a star slash to say that's the end of our code there. So now since it's a comment, it's not going to affect when you go to compile. It's just a comment, so it's going to ignore it. So this is the program that it's going to do. But at least you have now something you can print out and see and compare it and say, why is this doing this? And so let, let's just take a quick example here. Let's bring up the magnifier. And we took a look at why it's not on the first line, backslash n, it's going down a line each time. But let's take a look at the third line down. It says printf percent or backslash n percent 4i29. 4i means a field of 4, and it's printing 29 in a field of 4. Well, if it's printing 49 in a field of 4 and there's only two digits, then I think you can see that's why there's two spaces to the left of the 29, because it space fills in front of it. Now let's take a look at one other aspect here. This one here where it says printf backslash n backslash t percent 09.1. And what that's doing is it's going to go to, to a new line, but then it's going to go to a tab field. And the number it's printing is 40, minus 45.678, which is going to be rounded off to one decimal place. So it's going to be minus 45.7. And it's going to be after the first tab. So that's going to start at the ninth position. It's going to be uh, in a field of nine with one decimal place. 
Now if we slide down, and one of the things you'll notice is that there's percent zero 09 instead of just percent 9, so therefore it's going to zero fill. And if you do a little bit of reading and so forth, you should be able to figure out right here why it's doing this. It's If you look here, it's starting the negative at the ninth position, which is the first tab stop, zero filling, and you'll find that if you count it, the minus 00045.7 is completely in a field of nine. Please read over the, any notes that will help you understand this as we're about to go on to the next section of code. Now the reason for using pencil is on tests, quizzes, and so forth, you should really bring pencils in to write your code, especially if you're doing output and figuring out what the exact output is, because if you make a mistake, it's a lot easier erasing a pencil than trying to use gallons of whiteout to do ink. Now you'll notice a couple things in these labs. First of all, if we look uh, up at the top and go through it, it's basically fill in some blanks, fill in some blanks, and so on, get CH, fill in what that is. You can do that just about any time. But notice what we've got here, instructor's initials. This is called the performance-based part of your lab, which means that if you don't get this part accomplished while you're in the lab, you're going to lose marks because you don't have the instructor's initial. And we basically have two instructor's initials that you're going to need for today. So you make sure that you have this done in the lab that you can show the lab instructor if you've pre-done a lot of this stuff you could probably get credit and uh, or they may make you redo some of this stuff I don't know but in this case here we have to start a third program and we're going to call it lab 2c that's going to basically printf something backslash n backslash tab goodbye backslash n backslash tab backslash tab see you later backslash n backslash tab 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 5 percent percent of 100 backslash n backslash tab 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 yes backslash backslash no and that's basically what we're going to do for this last program but to do that we're going to have to do something with visual studio c plus plus express let's see how we go about setting that up and again what we've got up here is we've got lab 2b and what we have to do is remove that without erasing it so let's right mouse click go down to the remove and just hit the remove button here not the delete but the remove and once it's removed, we're going to again start with nothing in our source files. So what we're going to do is right mouse click, add, new item. And again, as before, we're going to make sure that it's code, C++, and then we're going to type in the name of Lab2C down here. Once we do the Lab2C and hit enter, it's ready to go. And we've got a blank slate to try writing in our code. Now this is a fairly simple application we have to write, and let's go full screen to write that. And what we're going to do is we're going to put in just the basic stuff that we need. Now I'm going to bring up our uh, fonts a little bigger. I'm going to go to options again, and this time I'm going to make our fonts about 21, because we don't have a lot of code to type, and it makes the video a little bit easier to see. So I'm going to type number sign include, bra left bracket standard io dot h, and I'm going to hit tab, backslash, backslash, or forward slash, forward slash, and we're going to put a comment that these are the def this contains definitions for printf, scanf, git char, and f flush. Okay, so that's what the definitions are for. And that's all we really need. We, of all those things that standard IO includes, we only really need printf because that's what we're going to do. Now for main, main is our mainline function, it's where everything grows from. We're going to say integer main bracket void and we're going to start with that and put in a bracket and put in another bracket down here and actually just this bit of code that we've got here is the smallest amount of code you can write in C to be a program it doesn't do anything but that's the minimum program that you can put in now our program is going to be fairly simple again let's go back and see what it is we have to do printf hello and I'm, I'm lazy so let's grab the hello because look at how lazy we are and let's put that in and say printf, whoops, printf, bracket, quote, control V, because it's on the top line, we don't want to do anything. Then we're going to put a backslash in, put a backslash tab, and here's where we get lazy again. Let's go back, and the next one is goodbye. So let's grab this, control C. So it's going to say hello, go to a new line, tab over, and say goodbye. And then we're going to do backslash in and two backslash tabs. And let's grab that other bit of text. See you later. Control C. Let's put that in. Control V. 
and let's stop it at that point and see what we've got. Now we're going to also need get char. We're going to need printf and get char. Get char is fine, as we said, as long as you're not using uh, scanf. Let's run that up and just see if it's going to work. And let's see if it's going to be close to what we need for output. It's very, very basic. We've written our first program, and this looks fairly close. It's, and you can see what it's doing here. Hello, backslash n, goodbye, backslash tab, goodbye, see you later. And if you compare this to what's on the sheet, we're, we're pretty much on our way to finishing this off. So let's take a look again at our sheet. And what we need over here now is 5% of 100, and we need a backslash n, and 1, 2, 3, four, whatever, one more, and a yes, backslash, backslash, no. So let's finish this up really quickly. So we're just going to put another printf in here. Printf, quote, backslash n, and we had two backslash tabs before, so we need three. Backslash tab, backslash tab, backslash tab, being the lazy guys that we are. 5% of 100, control C, let's bring that in, control V, but we have to have 2% to get a 1% up here. Then backslash n, and we need one more backslash tab, so it'll be four this time. Backslash tab, backslash tab, backslash tab, backslash tab, and yes, space, backslash, backslash, no, because that particular thing is special. And I think we'll find that if we run this up, it's going to work. Let's hope. Now notice one thing I didn't do that I should have done, is I should have done a, you're right, a clean. And sometimes you can get away with it, sometimes you can't, but this is what you need. Now let's bring this down and compare this to what we've got here, and I think you can see it works. And this is the end of lab number two. Make sure you've got lab three, four, five, and all your assignments, if they're available, printed out as soon as possible so you can continue on and do well in this course. And again, to finish this off, we aren't quite finished yet. What did I forget? Right mouse click, edit, mark, grab this so you can indeed see that exactly what your output is. And let's just to finish this off, because you should be printing these programs out. Forward slash says control V and star slash. And basically, you've got everything you need now to have completed lab number two. Good luck on this, and lab three is next.